Thank you for joining us here at Calvary Baptist Church in Larkspur, California and for our Sunday evening worship service. We are in the book of Acts and we invite you to take your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. Uh, we're going to begin reading with verse uh, 6. I invite you to stand if you can in honor of the reading of God's precious word. Acts chapter 1. We will begin with verse 1. Acts 1, beginning with verse 1. I'm sorry, beginning with verse 6. Acts 1, verse 6. Don't mean to lead you astray. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Our Heavenly Father, we are always very thankful, Lord, that we have the privilege of gathering in thy precious name and in thy presence uh, to worship you, uh, to give you glory and honor, to sing praises unto thy holy name. We thank you for those who uh, over uh, so many years have written um, uh, hymns and songs and spiritual songs and choruses uh, that um, we know bless our hearts, but we trust, Lord, many of them uh, really do uh, bless Thee and glorify Thee. That's what our desire is. And Lord, we're so thankful You give us Your precious and wonderful Word. We thank You for Thy Holy Spirit that uh, dwells within, uh, allowing us and enabling us to understand Thy truth. And so we do pray, Lord, that Thy Holy Spirit will teach us this evening Bless thy word to us. May we draw closer to thee, be more and more uh, appreciative of all and who thou art. And we give you the thanks and the praise in Christ's wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is recorded by Luke twice. He records it in the, at the end of the Gospel of Luke. And he records it here in the beginning of uh, Acts. Uh, Mark also uh, mentions the ascension of Christ. We begin before his ascension when we start at verse 6. Verses 6 through 8 says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time Restore the kingdom to Israel. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Notice, first of all, the disciples' question. They have a question for the Lord. Imagine now, at this point, they do not realize that he is going to leave. You know, he hasn't said to them, I'm going to ascend, but that he's been with them for 40 days uh, after the resurrection. And uh, so they have a question. Uh, and they say, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, when will you at this time restore, or will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? 
Now, the Jewish people were very interested in throwing off the yoke of the Romans. You know that. You've heard that many times. Uh, the disciples were wondering if the time had now come for Jesus to do that, to set up his kingdom, to overthrow the Roman Empire. Uh, they were ready. Uh, they were ready for Christ's kingdom, for the Messiah's kingdom. Uh, and, and so the question shows their faith in the Lord. Uh, they don't have any question that he truly is the Messiah and he is going to establish his kingdom. They know that from the Old Testament. They know those truths. And so they're very uh, keen on that. So it wasn't a question of uh, could he set it up, but simply when he would set up. Are you going to do this now? Uh, and, and Jesus, throughout his ministry, had been talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, he had been sharing that with them. Uh, he had been talking, though, about a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one, not a secular kingdom. But they, because they had been steeped in the teaching that told them, uh, that, uh, which was biblical, that the, the kingdom would be restored to Israel, they just focused on that. And, you know, sometimes... Uh, our past or what we've learned or something uh, causes us to think the same way, maybe about certain things. Um, I know folks have uh, sometimes been in certain churches that uh, preach very strongly about one particular translation of the scriptures. And it's really pounded into them uh, so much that it actually uh, consumes their thinking. And so uh, they, uh, their first reaction to somebody, the first time they talk to somebody uh, is, do you use this translation? And, uh, and if you don't, many of them say, well, I can't go to your church or I can't fellowship with you or I can't, you know, uh, which is totally unbiblical, but that's what they've been taught. And so they have been taught this. They have been taught the coming of the kingdom for Israel. And that's what they're looking for. Now notice the Lord's answer to them. He gives it here in verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Jesus doesn't rebuke them, but he does tell them some really important information. First of all, it was not the time time for them to know. They were not to know this. This was not something that they were to know this information. He didn't deny that one day he would set up the kingdom. What he had told them was that they were not to permitted to know the time, the exact time. You know, I'm sure you've run across people, and there still goes on today, I don't know why, who set dates. Uh, it, it seems somebody, you know, they're studying the Bible and everything, and they go, oh, I've discovered it. Maybe they've done it through numerology, or maybe they've done it for some other way, and they, and they really get consumed with it. There are way too many pastors who have done this over the years. Uh, I think I told you, uh, we, uh, when we were in Ohio, there was a dear family in a church who uh, owned a Christian bookstore. They still own it, by the way. And uh, in 1988, uh, a pamphlet came out, a little booklet, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 88. And they couldn't keep them. There was, people were coming in, buying those, and they kept on ordering, and it was just, you know, they just couldn't keep enough of them. Well, at the end of 1988, Jesus hadn't come back. Now, you would think at that point that that would be the end of it. That preacher wrote a new pamphlet. 89 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1989. Now, I remember when that book came out and I told the dear lady and her husband who, who had the bookstore, I said, you know, that, that's totally wrong. The Bible tells us we're not going to know. Uh, and, uh, and it's amazing because you realize that most of the people who bought that booklet were Christians 
in churches. Wouldn't they have heard? Wouldn't they have known? Reading their Bibles, wouldn't they have come across the fact that we're not to know? But people think they do. Uh, people who set uh, prophetic uh, dates for prophetic events uh, either don't know their Bibles or they don't believe them. It's one or the other. So Jesus makes it very clear uh, that this is something only the Father knows and it is under His sovereignty. That is under His own authority. He has determined, He has decided that no one is to know this until it happens. Just one of those things. The kingdom was to be restored to Israel, but the question is, when is it going to happen? And that is a divinely kept secret. We do not know. We do not know when Christ is coming back. The Bible is very clear about this. And to speculate is foolishness. It's a waste of time. There's a lot more important things. Uh, now, Jesus had told them previously in Luke, in chapter 19, chapter 21, what was going to be taking place. Uh, the destruction of the temple and, and the scattering and all those things. And so uh, he, he tells them these things are going to take place. Jerusalem would destroy. Um, and they must stop looking for a material kingdom. And they needed to start working for a spiritual kingdom. A new age, the church age, uh, had to intervene before the kingdom would be restored to Israel. Israel was still unrepentant. Israel was still rejecting their Messiah. And there was not going to be that kingdom that they were looking forward to. Not at that time. Now that kingdom will be established someday. Uh, that's the millennial kingdom. Uh, that, will, that prophecy will be fulfilled, but not then and not now. God has his time, and he is the only one who knows that. And we don't need to know. You know, a lot of these things that uh, people spend so much time on, they're so consumed with. And, and you know, you think you would spend your time better going out and witnessing to people and, and, and reading the Word and... and reaching out instead of just being consumed with these things. But that's what happens. Now, notice the Lord also has a promise. Uh, he says here, verse 8, But you shall, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. First, Jesus tells them here that they were going to receive power. It would be the Holy Spirit who would come upon them and indwell them and empower them. It always takes the power of the Holy Spirit for us to serve the Lord. A lot of service to Christ uh, is done outside the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, somebody has said that the Holy Spirit could depart from most churches and no one would know it. And things would go on as they've always gone on. All the activities, all the events, uh, the services, everything would go on and there would, no one would have the slightest idea that the Holy Spirit was not working in the body of Christ. It takes strength, it takes power, it takes the ability of the Holy Spirit in our lives to serve the Lord. And he gives us that power and it is a divine power. By the way, when God calls us to do something, God enables us to do that. Second of all, Jesus tells them that they would become witnesses. You shall be witnesses. <clears throat> and this promise here, all of this promise is not just for the disciples, it's for all of us. Um, now, when he says here, you shall be witnesses to me, uh, the correct way of translating that is not that your witness is to Christ, but of Christ. That's the idea there. Um, and so they were to be witnesses to the Lord. Uh, they were not called to be lawyers. Uh, they were not called to argue the case before the minds of men, which we sometimes do. Uh, 
Um, I know I was somewhat taught that when I first got saved and um, taught how to do it. Uh, and uh, you know, you have a lot of failures. Uh, you get some quote unquote converts. Some people do really get saved, but others don't really get saved. As my pastor said, the most of them last about five years and then they're gone. Uh, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they were called to be witnesses. A witness simply tells what they have seen and heard. If you've ever seen an accident or some other type of thing like that and you're called to court, they don't want your opinion. They want to know, what did you hear? What did you see? That type of thing. That's all they want. And that's what a witness is. They tell what happened. <clears throat> Third, Jesus tells them where they were to be witnesses. Notice, first of all, he says, in Jerusalem. Now, that's where they were located at this time. I know they were from Galilee. That was their normal home. But this is where they were. They were there. And so they were to begin where they were, uh, their own community. Uh, with their neighbors, their family, friends, people around them. They were all to witness, and that's where proper witness begins. It begins in our own, if I may say it this way, backyard, in our own neighborhood. We should think about, all right, who's on my right hand? Who's on my left hand? Who's across the street? Now, that doesn't mean every time you talk to them, you're going to be able to take out a gospel track and go through the, God's simple plan of salvation. But we establish uh, relationships and we reach out and we do things for people and we pray for them and we watch God open doors for us to be able to witness. And sometimes it can take a long, long time and sometimes it doesn't. But we have to have that compassion and we, that's where it starts. Uh, there is, I'm going to be honest with it, there's too much of the church being excited about missions, which is extremely important, we'll get that in a moment, but failing to realize we live in a mission field. This is our mission field. This is where God has remained for us. And he's planned, pla placed us where he wants us to be so that we might be witnesses there. Uh, and then they were to reach out next to Judea. Uh, they were to evangelize, we can put it this way, their own country. Um, home missions are just as important as foreign missions. Uh, I thank the Lord for those who are trying to st plant churches. Uh, you know, we think of America as churches everywhere. We think of being, you know, uh, and, and really compared to the rest of the world, that is true. But there are huge number of places in our country where there are no churches or no sound biblical churches at all. And so we should never, never uh, neglect our own country, home missions. Uh, if we don't exercise about reaching our own country, how can we be exercise about reaching someone else's country? It's almost maybe a little too easy. Well, we can, you know, let's reach those people. But we have to reach them here. Uh, then, he said Samaria. Samaria was between Judea and Galilee. Now, they knew all about the Samaritans. The Samaritans were their, uh, their neighbor country. The Samaritans were oftentimes half Jewish and half Gentile. They were a mixed race. Uh, and uh, they had very deep-seated racial and religious prejudice against the Samaritans. We read that in the scriptures. Uh, you remember they were told that they would, uh, the Jewish people would go around. They would actually go across the Jordan. They would go up and then cross the Jordan again because they didn't want to go through Samaria. And it's so interesting how Jesus, the Bible says, must go through Jerusalem because the, there were souls there to be saved. There were people, and they were hungry. They responded wonderfully. Uh, and so the Jewish people, these people, even though they'd gone through that, 
He reminds you, you need to meet, reach these people too. Don't neglect the Samaritans. And that was out of their comfort zone. And that's something else we have to realize. We may be out of our comfort zone. It's not always easy. It is not an easy thing to be a good witness, let me tell you. Don't think, I, I, a lot of people think, oh well, he went to you know, Bible school and college and seminary and all those things, and so man, he, he just got it down. He, it's so simple for him, and he just walks up to somebody and, oh, let me tell you about Jesus. No! I don't care, they didn't have a vaccine for it when I went to school. I didn't get a vaccine when I got saved. Uh, I'm just like anybody else. Uh, I know I can talk and I know I converse with people and I know I can be friendly with people and all that stuff. And it's still not that easy. I understand that. But how can we do it? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We trust the Holy Spirit. We pray about it and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. Uh, then we don't have any excuse with, I don't know enough or I'm shy or I don't know how to talk to people, all those stuff. By the way, we all know how to talk to people. Uh, we all know how to converse. We all know how to pass information on. Uh, you just think of something you really like a lot. Uh, around our block, there's a, there's a, a young fellow that I know, and, and um, the magazines that uh, uh, Joe and I share, and, and Tom and I used to share, I share with that man. Now, I guarantee you, I know what every conversation we're going to have when I show up. Uh, in fact, he just went out and bought himself a Datsun 510, just like what my wife and I's second car was. So, you know what happens. We, that's the conversation. And it's not easy to get him off of that, you know. And I thank the Lord that we, I remember when I first came, we didn't have a relationship. He, he, he was like, uh, you know, keep this guy away. But I found there was a connection. And, and I, we talk about many things. I've stood with him looking under the hood. Now, I don't know anything. But I had, you know, having owned one, I had some idea. And, you know, we'd, we're sitting there, you know, typical guys, you know, we're under the hood hoping it doesn't fall on our head. And we're... <laughs> We're pointing at things. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, and, I, and I'm sitting there going, looking at some things. I say, you know, that doesn't, that does, that's not original. I don't remember that on our car. And uh, we, we have things that we can talk with people about and trust and ask God to open doors for us to go beyond that. <clears throat> and then they were to continue into all the earth. He says, and to the end of the earth. Um, this means the gospel was to go to everywhere, to everyone, including the Gentiles. And they still didn't totally understand that. You look in the book of Acts as we're going along, you'll see they don't get that yet. It takes them a while before they get that. They're, they're you know, Paul has to come along and Peter and tell them, you know, oh, well, we've been preaching to the Gentiles too. Oh, you can't do that. But he already told them to do that. <clears throat> they were to start where they were. They were to work progressively to the rest of the world. And by the way, when we read the history, not only in the book of Acts and the New Testament, but when we read it historically, we see what an incredible thing that those Christians did those first two, three, four hundred years. It is unbelievable. They reached thousands upon thousands of people all over the Mediterranean, the whole Roman world. It is really something. Uh, many believe, and, and we, uh, we don't have any scripture for that, that, that they reached down into India. And of course, we know they reached all the way to, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, you know, in Spain. I don't know if they went to Portugal or not, but they, they reached that area. I don't know that Portugal actually existed at that time. I'm not sure when that separated from, from all of them. <clears throat> now, when we go out, we're not to take and spread Americanism or America. 
uh, our culture. Uh, we're not to find, uh, found colonies. We're not to convert people to some kind of ideology. We are to introduce people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're, not to, we're not to deal with politics and all those other things. All this stuff gets all mixed up in here. Yeah. We're to be witnesses unto Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does the rest. If we're trusting Him, <clears throat> we're the messenger, we take the message. But it's the Holy Spirit who's going to empower that. Now, now we look at the Lord's ascension. They talk to Him, and now the ascension. In verse 9, it says, Now... When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So when Jesus had finished teaching, he ascended to uh, his ascension took place. Um, the disciples didn't see the resurrection. If you remember, they didn't see the resurrection. They saw the result of it. They saw Christ after he was raised. They saw him alive. But now they needed to see physically his ascension because he wasn't going to come back. So they needed to actually see this to be a witness to others. They had to be able to say, we actually were standing there and he rose up and a cloud took him and he was gone. They had to be able to witness to that. They had to have that proof. They, that was part of their witness. And as Jesus Christ ascended, the Bible tells us at some point a cloud took him up. He went, it came up, either the cloud came down and picked him up or he went into the cloud. And that would have had to have been unusual because it would have been pretty low and he would have gone up. It cut off the vision of Christ as he ascended. If the cloud had not been there, they would have still been standing there for a very, very long time, watching, watching, watching. It was important that they saw him descend, but it wasn't important for them to keep on watching and watching and watching. Losing Christ had to be a very, very hard experience. But God helps us when we go through difficult things and times. Thus Jesus went home, up through the clouds, up beyond the stars, back to the glory of heaven where he came from, to sit at the right hand of the Father. And what a glorious thing that is for us, because there he is at the right hand of the Father. There he is ever interceding for us. He is our mediator. He is our advocate. He is right there with the Father. He's our great high priest, touched with the feelings of our infirmities, able to minister on our behalf as the perfect kinsman redeemer. When we fail, when we sin, and Satan points the finger, Jesus rises up and said, I paid the penalty. I died for them. They are one of mine. You know, you can hire the greatest lawyer in the world and he could still lose his case. And by the way, our case isn't good. But what an advocate we have in Jesus Christ. What an advocate. So here's what happened after Jesus' ascension. Verse 10 says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. It was a sorrowful experience. Um, no wonder they looked steadfastly up. Uh, no wonder they couldn't take their eyes off the spot where he had been. And so there 
and it might be a little hard for us to imagine it, but think about this, they're all standing there looking up and all of a sudden these two men appear and now they're angels uh, but they are called men because that's how they appear and when we go through the scriptures we see other appearances of them of angels different ones and so there they are they're in white apparel we know they're angels how they're dressed how they appear and what their message is um, Gazing up into heaven was not the disciples' duty. It's not what God called them to do. They had to come out of that. Or they might have become, as we used to say, so heavenly minded they were no earthly good. Now, the Bible says that we are to be heavenly minded. But we also can get so focused like that that we also fail to have the focus where God wants us to have as well. He says, set your affection, your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. The angels had an important message for the disciples and an important one for you and I. They said, who also said, men of the Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from heaven and you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So the first thing they asked them, the disciples, is why are you still looking up? He's gone. He's gone. He's gone back to heaven. But there was a great promise here. Now, this is not speaking of the rapture, I don't think, personally. I know some I've read, they, they think it's the rapture. Um, it is the second coming of Christ, and in one sense, the rapture is the beginning of the second coming of Christ, but it very specifically says that he will be seen, just as he went going up, he will be seen coming back. The Bible indicates in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that he's not seen. He comes in the clouds. He comes above the earth. He does not come to the earth. But when he comes after the tribulation period, he will come right to the earth. He will stand on the Mount of Olives. There will be that splitting, all those things that we read in the scriptures. So this, I believe, is they're talking about when he comes back to come and rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. What a great encouragement that had to have been. It was, I'm sure, to them. And it is to us as well. Jesus is coming back. Uh, he told his disciples in, in John chapter 14 uh, that he was coming back. And he tells them again he was going to come back, and he is coming back. But the Bible also warns us that there are going to be those who are going to say, well, where is his coming? We haven't seen it. Why hasn't he come back? And it's a little tough when, you know, you've been... 2,000 years and we look back and you say, well, he hasn't come back yet. But we must always live with the anticipation, with the heart that says he can come back at any moment and he can come back in my lifetime. And I, I remember when I first got saved and there were some who just didn't seem to grasp that too much. Uh, others I think grasp it in the wrong way. I think I told you some, some of the folks in our church I found out were not paying their, their visa bill because, well, Jesus is going to come back. Wow. What a shock that was. But uh, <laughs> he is coming back. And what blessed my heart were those who in all sincerity and, and real true belief, as we should, I believe he's coming back before I die. Mm -hmm. I believe he's coming back before I die. And, you know, it's been a long time since I've been saved. And, you know, we look back over these years and we think things got worse and worse and worse, as Jesus told us they would. And we're now sitting there going like, he's got to come back. <laughs> well, he doesn't have to come back. He's coming back. 
We just don't know when. We need to be always prepared for his return. At the same time, we must not sit back and just wait. We do not know when he's coming. And uh, we don't want to be, as we used to say, caught flat-footed. Jesus is coming again. But we have a responsibility to reach out to those around us. Don't ever, ever think that it's just a few. How many were there with Jesus? Just the disciples? Just a few? And they turned the world upside down. In God's power, the same can take place. It has many, many times, thousands of times, over the last 2,000 years in all kinds of places. One of the great things is to read about revivals. Just reading about the revivals that have taken place in this country is absolutely marvelous. It's a great blessing. It cheers our hearts. We haven't had any really great revivals in quite a long time, but why shouldn't we? We can't work it up. We can't create a revival. If we have an evangelist come, we may call it a revival, but we don't know if it's going to be a revival or not. God is the one who brings a revival. But our hearts need to be ready. Our hearts need to be praying for it. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for God's Spirit. And wherever He's going to come and bring revival and rejoice that it's, if it's there or here or wherever it might be. I can remember reading years ago uh, in, uh, in, in London, uh, there was some very large churches uh, back in the 1800s. We all have heard of Charles Haddon Spurgeon preaching uh, uh, 5,000 people Sunday morning, 5,000 Sunday night. Uh, there was another pastor, uh, Joseph Parker, in another part of London, he preached the thousands uh, every Sunday. Um, and uh, G. Campbell Morgan, those, the latter years, uh, Campbell Morgan died in about 43 or 4, I forget when it was, 42. Um, so he was, he was pastoring back in the end of the 1800s. And uh, they didn't have a big church. They had a large building, but they didn't have a large congregation. And uh, at first, it, you know, he, he looked at this church and that one and kind of wondered about it. And G. Campbell Morgan was known as a great expositor. Uh, a number of books he's done. And, and so it was a little, it was tough, difficult. Then God laid something on his heart. And he encourages people. He said, let's pray for those churches that they'll be so filled that we'll get a little of the overhand, the, the, the um, yeah. And you know, that's what actually happened. Eventually that church was filled as well. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises that we are given here. Not just to the disciples, but to us as well. Jesus is coming again. We have a great, great, wonderful message, the only great message in all the world. We have a great power in the Holy Spirit. We have a great opportunity before us. Lord, lay some soul upon our hearts. May we be witnesses in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities, our own state, our own country, wherever you would have us to be. Be with our missionaries. What a blessing it is, Lord, to be able to uh, know and support and pray for and do things and projects and visit missionaries in different parts of the world. We praise you and thank you for that, Lord. And we pray, Lord, though, that we'll never forget that we live 
in a mission field. And there's souls to be saved. And there's witnessing. We can't win them. That's the Holy Spirit's work. But we can be witnesses. Give us compassion. Give us the compassion of Christ. May we pray for our neighbors and our friends and relatives. And may we see a harvest to the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.